I'm absolutely delighted to be with you here because I, I've got some, having had a long and interesting life, I've got some what I consider to be important lessons and messages to share with you. Here's the little house we had in our garden for visitors west of um, Sydney in, pa in Kenthurst. Little wattle and daub house we grew up with as kids. What I'm going to talk to you about today is what is comfort? It's really important that you understand the limits of comfort. Where are we now? Then I will explain to you why buildings are like frozen music. Talk about thermal landscaping of buildings and how to assess what constitutes a good building because there's a lot of confusion now. I'm an expert in thermal comfort and comfort research started really with health and safety issues, um, with troops being sent to India and so on, or people working in factories or down mines. What I have done, I should note here that I'll give you a copy of these and I've put all the references, so I'll just pass on and if anybody's interested, they just go to the references to look at it. So what is thermal comfort? It's a state of mind. If you feel on the scale, there are various scales, but roughly slightly warm, slightly cool or neutral, you're deemed to be comfortable. Now, the mind is managed by the senses. Um, it's managed from the brain and many of the senses exist in our skin. And it's designed, the thermal sense, to keep our core body temperature at 37 degrees centigrade. So when we emerge from the steppelands of Africa, you know, XT, XT million years ago, um, we still had the same body, deep core body temperature. Wherever you go in the world, we are an animal with that body temperature. The thermal sense also warns us of danger. When is it getting too hot? When is it get, uh, getting too cold? How do we maintain that core temperature? Now, there are two kinds of thermal comfort research. There are the climate change chamber studies, um, started in America and, and a lot in Denmark too, under Ole Fanger. And um, they are experiments done in controlled conditions with full and detailed measurements of everything. They're very accurate, but they don't give you lo locally appropriate data. <coughs> it's based on the PMV and the preferred mean vote and the PPD um, are based on simple steady state calculations. It's the physics of the system, how you interact with the world around you. It's about how much activity you're doing, how much metabolic heat you're generating, what clothing you're wearing, and what are the environmental conditions around you. And Thermal comfort standards are politically determined and heavily lobbied for. And you can see this really interesting graph here. This is Japanese and US comfort standards for summer, um, and from 1941 to 2008. And you can see they've changed over time with different political occurrences. The first oil crisis, the second oil crisis, uh, the Kyoto Protocol, and here we have, for instance, in Japan, Fukushima, which they turned off all the nuclear power stations, so they had a problem, and they introduced a law overnight that nobody in certain government buildings could turn the air conditioning on till the inside temperature reached 28 degrees centigrade um, to save energy. Look at the way the US goes, though, because, of course, the narrower the band of your um, comfort standards, the more machines you have to sell to, to create it. So... In the face of all that, the, the comfort standards go down. We've got the Kyoto Protocols, so we've got a degree or so um, increase in the, the comfort temperature to just as a gesture. But if you look here, these are the new international PMV-related thermal comfort standards. So the engineers will go into a, a client and they say, well, let's face it, what do you want? Do you want an A-rated building, a B-rated building, or do you want a rubbishy old C-rated building? <coughs> and the A-rated building you see here is bang on the comfort temperature, plus or minus half a degree centigrade. Well, 
I mean, look, in that corner over there, in this corner here, there's going to be a couple of degrees in it anyway, aren't there? How do you do it? Bloody great machine and uh, huge amounts of energy. And a rubbishy old C-rated building, which you can open the window and naturally ventilate it, is, you know, of course, the ignorant client is going to say, well, I want an A-rated building. Wrong answer. There is another approach to comfort research. This is the field studies approach. And this is where you go in to ask real people in real buildings with their normal behaviours. You say, um, how comfortable are you? And you look at the, the controls, the blinds, the windows, the fans. You note the clothing and you measure the environment around you. And um, it gives you relevant local data. So you know what temperatures people are actually comfortable at, but it's not particularly precise like a, a laboratory study. But let's face it, we all know that comfort is about a lot more than just the physics. This is Trevor in Pakistan. I think it was largely about the beer he'd just drunk, but... What my colleague Michael Humphreys did was in early on at the building research establishment was to go out and take, they did comfort studies around the world. Each one might be 100, 200 people. And they plotted them, the mean comfort vote, that's the neutral temperature in the middle there, comfortably warm, comfortably cool. And they measured the mean globe temperature those people were in. And they suddenly discovered that people are comfortable this huge range of temperatures, and, and trust me, I spent seven years living in Baghdad or Iraq, and we were perfectly comfortable, and central Iran, perfectly comfortable at 36, 38. But if you haven't experienced it, you cannot imagine it. Whereas some people, uh, some of our Nepalese studies now show people living in living room temperatures of about 13 degrees centigrade. So what have you got? What, what temperatures are people comfortable at? That's their neutral reported comfort temperature against the mean temperatures they occupy. And you see what happens? If you live in a cold climate, you're comfortable at a cold temperature. If you live in a hot climate, you're comfortable in a hot temperature. Because people are comfortable at the temperatures they occupy. And this is the adaptive principle. If uncomfortable, people look for ways to be comfortable in a complex dynamic system. People control buildings, buildings modify the climate, and the climate shapes the cultures and the behaviors and the attitudes of the people in it. So it's, it's, a, it's an organic system, it's a thermal ecosystem. But you'll be very interested. So we know that the deep body temperature is 38. What do you think our, I mean, if you, what do you think that a comfort temperature might be? Has anybody got an idea? No, actually, it's, that's too complex a question. But um, physiological responses, because we have these involuntary actions. You can see here, we shiver, we sweat when we get too hot, and we've got this complex vasodilation system. It's all interacting with the core tissues, the skin, how much clothing you're wearing, how different the environment is. Now, probably most of us look a bit like this every night. <coughs> you know, it's a bit hot, so you stick your leg out, you know, and all of you will be behaving. And there's a gentleman there who's a bit chilly, someone's a bit chilly, someone's got a T-shirt spread out. We are continually changing our body shapes, our clothing, etc., etc., to adapt. And funnily enough, you'll be surprised to know that non-thermogenic shivering, where the muscles start to begin to work to heat the body up, begins at about 28 degrees centigrade. Because, of course, you've got to keep your core temperature at 37. And that's much higher, isn't it? Because we've been so trained. There is some wonderful work being done in Maastricht on the thermoneutral zone. And this is a physiological sweet spot. If, if we were all sort of, um, well, I shouldn't, wearing no clothes, if it's completely naked, the average of our, our thermoneutral zone would be around about 28 degrees centigrade to 32. That's in which, that's the temperature band in which 
little or no action, so no metabolic energy is needed, to keep our deep core temperature at 38. Because, you know, of course, we're always working. We're at the, the liver, the heart, everything's generating heat anyway. So that's the sweet zone. And anybody who lives up in the tropics will um, know that actually on a cool day with a, you know, when you're not doing anything much, you'd be quite, that's a really nice comfort zone. So behavioral responses, <coughs> there are many different things we do to make sure that we are comfortable and keep our core temperature safe. We do more or less work, we have environmental controls, we change from sitting in the sunny place to the cool place or vice versa, and we change our clothing. That's the, that's the easiest first step. You wear appropriate clothing for the climate, and then again, like that little boy in bed, you, you change your clothing according to where you particularly sit here in Peru. There's a cold wind over that warm stone wall. So they're quite happy with their nice little warm legs in the sun with the warm wall behind them, but they're a bit chilly on top. So it's continual rearrangement. And again, we're slightly like animals in that if we, we've done studies all around the world, and the point at which you start to sweat, this is 32s about your mid-skin temperature, um, we all start to sweat largely at the same time. We take off clothes at the same time. We like more air velocity. velocity. We turn off heaters, turn on fans. There's so many different ways in which we are constantly, probably semi-consciously, adapting our environment. So here's some work we did for many years in Pakistan. And within 10 degrees, people are perfectly comfortable by changing their environment. Don't forget, it's a habitual environment, so it's customary. So what we have is adaptive thermal comfort standards. And there's a very good book we've done on it, quite easy. Um, and basically, you know, the warmer it is outside, the higher the comfort standard. But look at this range. It's plus or minus 4 degrees centigrade. It's quite... Fine, so depending on the, the time out, the, the temperature outside, what can you do? Between about 32, 34 and 18, you just simply open the window for more comfort. So if you've got a HEVAC engineer who tells you you can't design the building you want to because you've got to have an internal temperature of 24 degrees centigrade, you say, nah, we'll, we'll just we'll change our HEVAC engineer, actually. We'll go for one. So the trouble is that here we've got temperature clouds. Now we, we've moved on to, now we're looking at clouds. These averaged mean responses aren't again that interesting in, in climate. So we look at clouds. What do individual people feel or experience? We've got indoor temperatures against outdoor temperatures here. And in offices, it's rather different. Does this shape fit houses? In well-serviced and centrally controlled offices um, and other public buildings, the PMV model probably fits fairly well. But in houses, we all know what we do to keep warm and cool, whether it's put on a pair of socks, light the fire, have a cocoa, open the windows. We also pay the energy bills. And... Um, <coughs> If you look at this data, these are clouds, this is comfort clouds, these are individual responses. This is 25 degrees centigrade, and there is a sweet spot. This is Japanese homes with cooling, with heating. These are the temperatures that they occupy. So it's not a matter of whether you're comfortable or not, it's just what you do every day, and you adapt to those temperatures. This is in Japanese homes, free running, no heating or cooling, you're just using... And you know, a lot of Japanese homes like paper walls and so on. So, you know, we, as, as, um, with our own lifestyles and uh, assumptions, say, oh my God, how can they be comfortable in that? But um, there is, again, that sweet spot here, about 23, 24, 25. It's like 
the comfort zone, your TNZ with a few clothes on. It's, it's um, fairly sensible. Now, if you look here, we've got... Um, that just note that when you've got a heated or cooled building, you actually have a larger range of temperatures inside than if you just open the window often, because you open the window when it's, you know, acceptable outside too. But this is how they do it in Japan often. It's like in Iran. This is like Kursi in Iran. You just have a nice little heater under the table, and um, many, many Japanese homes just... You see the walls are paper. And that room temperature is very different from the actual temperature of the people. And they, they'll spend the, you know, the winter months there. And this is occupied temperatures in British homes. Mean daily temperature, 10 degrees centigrade, 25 degrees centigrade, English homes, August to January. None of us live in the same temperatures. You know, there is... You can see here, if we, if we put all of this, um, we've, got we've got studies from all around the world, and we put them in these clouds now, Fergus does. Uh, you know, Japan, Damam in the Gulf, UK. And what do you get out of this? Not comfortable te temperatures, but tolerable or occupied temperatures. And we've got a range here from 10 to 35 degrees centigrade indoors, right? So that is acceptable temperatures. So if you're looking to do your calculations, you can roughly say, if you're getting above 35 degrees centigrade, then the nice fan or the ceiling fan's not gonna work because 32 with a fan gives you 35, you know? So that gives you a good operational range, you know? If the outdoor temperature is 35, you can just use passive means, really. Um, and then you've got a sweet spot in the middle. So this is a very different approach. It's, it's an approach. I mean, there is no such thing as a comfort temperature. Comfort is a psychological state of mind. It's about accustomed and habitual temperatures you occupy. And it's defined by culture, economics, and so on. And, you know, traditionally it was achieved just through the evolution of a appropriate um, standards. So here we have this key thing. 28 to 32 is your, you know, what you, with a light cotton frock on is fine. Um, but we're in the grip of standards. I mean, they try, of course, there are international standards like the ISO standard. There's the American ASHRAE standards. And then the, there are the SEN, the European standards. This is Punta, um, Palermo Punta Raisa in Brazil. And you can see, if you use the ISO standard, you just literally have it 24.5 all, all the time. If you use the adaptive ASHRAE standard, you've got a bit of leeway. But if you use our new international um, European standard, where you're just tracking the outdoor mean temperature, so the hotter it gets outside, it just crank, you can put an algorithm in your, your controls. Um, look at this, you're getting two or three degrees reduction in your cooling load anyway. And does this matter? Yeah, because the more you spend on cooling, the, um, the more you're just basically throwing your money away. But it's all dependent on what climates. And this is work done by... Um, the Ed Ahrens and his team in Berkeley. So the more you set, for instance, if you set your thermostat from 24 to 28 in these different climates, San Francisco, you're going to save 30-40% of your cooling money. Well, that's, it's not about improving the efficiency of your air conditioner by 2%. It's a step change. So, sorry, I mean, anybody who wants to know more about it, just read our books, and they'll be referenced in the papers I've done. But with this madness of standards, pushing the world into this catastrophe, and, and Mary, Maria was saying about in Toronto now, they're air conditioning everything, because they have to with, because of the standards. But there are alternative standards. We need standards that encourage high en low energy buildings, not high energy buildings, but they have to be comfortable. 
So how about a standard where, you know, the good building was one that didn't use any energy at all over the year? Uh, and a B, but that's an A building. B only uses energy part of the year, and C is, is uses energy all year. That's, that's the standards we need. But there's this whole new movement, and you chaps will really love. Do go and have a look at www.lowtechmagazine. He's brilliant. It's Chris van der Decker. And uh, it's basically, you know, why, why would we heat and cool whole buildings when we can just heat and cool people? If anybody's interested, we're organising this conference next April. Where are we now? We're at a place in which buildings are failing around the world for three reasons, climatic reasons. They're built in the wrong place. I mean, would you go and build now on St. Martin? They're wrongly built to withstand current and future climates. It doesn't matter how rich you are. You know, the wind doesn't respect that. And we're also having these extreme events. And here we have um, 2003 heatwave. 72,000 people died in Europe. By 2045, that's predicted to be every second summer, that temperature. By 2065, possibly that'll be a cool summer. So you know, wake up and spell, spend the coffins. But we've also got this other phenomenon that's creeping, and that's the phenomenon of the disappearing middle classes. We earn the same every year, but the value of what we have at home goes down. So you and I probably can't afford as much as we could five years ago. And then, I mean, that's not even to mention the brittle or peaky energy systems. You know, even the eastern seaboard, 50 million without for 24 hours, India... 250 million without power. And um, so what have we done? I mean, how have we approached this? We've got what I call 20th century approaches. And now this is a book we did in 1990, Energy Efficient Building. It's basically Passive House. Passive House is the German system. He slightly got it wrong because he said the idea that the heat gains over a year exceed the heat losses Unfortunately, you gain the heat in summer, you lose it in winter. That kind of slipped by. So the houses they designed are suitable for high Tyrolean or um, German mountain zones, highly passive solar, but um, they have this terrible tendency to overheat. Insulation, good windows, airtight, no thermal bridging, heat recovery, and a lot of them are fixed window buildings. It's a very simplistic, very 19... Um, 19th century um, solution. Then we got onto the noughties. We're all into sustainability. And that's a book I did in 2003, I think. Oh, everything, you know, oh, everything was going to be sustainable. Oh, everything we measure. Trouble is, it's all apples and pears. So we got the rating systems. And who was writing these rating systems? Because, for instance, in this is our, our sustainable housing thing, you get 2.5 points in the mandatory energy section for a better building, 2.5 energy efficient external light bulb, and 2.5 for a um, cycle store. Well, you only needed two out of five to get top marks. So what do you do? You certainly don't build a better building. You put in the light bulb, don't you? Active house, the Danes are much better than the passive house there. That was much more sophisticated. They were looking at comfort, environment, and so on. They were starting to look at thermal storage, natural ventilation, the adaptive envelope, active solar systems. But overheating is still the problem. So welcome to the teens. The agenda is changing. Now, that's another book I did. Um, second edition is 2009, I think designed for radical new thinking. And really, if you're doing your own homes, rethink the paradigm, because what we did before is not necessarily going to keep us safe into the future. So I'm looking at resilience, and having lived in the Middle East in the really hot deserts, I designed this Oxford Eco House, that's the first solar roof in Britain, to be um, really, really thermally stable. It's, it's using concrete, not mud. But it's looking at designing buildings with climate refuges, actually climate proofing, so that in 20 years' time, when it's two or three degrees centigrade hotter than we're used to 
it's safe, your climate safe. Of course, run on solar energy with storage and lots of adaptive opportunities. Now, here's the interesting bit. Everybody used to call it, do you remember, buildings of frozen music? Well, this is Goethe um, saying, I call architecture frozen music. I'll show you how this could work. Now, this is from Perfume Science. You all will have bought your wives hundreds of bottles of perfume, obviously, or enjoyed the benefits of such, you know, largesse. But a perfume science is designed like, like a, perfume is designed like a musical chord. It has three notes in it. You have a top note, which, oh, when you spray it on, it is fresh, sharp, assertive. It wakes your senses up and says, now you're going to sense. That's your top note, like a bergamot or a mint or a lemon. The second note is really the personality of the perfume. It's the big flower smells, the mellow, rounded, the jasmine, the tuberose, very beautiful. Um, that's the personality of the perfume. But a perfume is the third note, is the bass note. That's the long one. So the first one will last a few seconds or a minute, the second one a couple of hours, and then kicks in the bass note. And that bass note is the long lasting, it's the depth, the solidity. That gives the perfume its character. Yeah, that's so the more expensive, probably the more durable, the base note, musk, myrrh, frankincense, something that will give you that extension. How to design a comfortable building? Let's make a chord, right? Um, step one, a really good base note. You can have a psychotic base note or you can have a really good base note. Something that it's about... All of those elements of a building you can't change. So it's orientation, form, height in the sky, overhangs, and the form of the building. Um, and let's just, for the sake of argument, say a good level one or step one building, a good, a so-so step one building, and a bad step one building. It's going to have a really psychotic, every time the sun comes out, it's going to go up and down and... Of course, if you have a good step one building, you don't need any extra energy. A so-so one, you'll need a bit more. In a psychotic step one building, you're going to need huge amounts of energy just to keep it habitable. Let's go on to step two, which is the personality. So that's the basic character. If you've got a well-behaved, good character, now we go on to the personality of the building, and it's all the elements you can change. You can change the window types, openings, infiltration. You can change occupancy, internal loads, shades, curtains, everything. Uh, you, you change all the, every 10 years or 15 years, you'll change your heating systems. This is the changeable things, but it will be very much the personality of the building and, and how it looks. And you can, you know, the castle has been occupied, Stirling Castle for maybe a thousand years, and you know, the personality will change every, every 50 years or so. So if you take an ordinary step one building, all the HEVAC engineers will make level two or step two adaptations, We largely in order to change the, your comfort, will all be mechanical. Whereas a, even a so-so building can be a low energy building, not a high energy <coughs> building, if you get the passive solar, the natural ventilation into it, that's architecture. So where are all the architects in? You know, a lot of them are just not there. They just say, oh my God, here's my, my great building. Hand it over to the HEVAC engineer and you're getting these high energy buildings. So it's the times, basically, we really need the re-emergence of architecture. Step three is that, that top note. It's all about the mind. Oh my God, this is so awful or brilliant or, you know, and um, a lot of architects are, tra oh, sorry, 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 a lot of architects are trained in the schools of architecture. I've got a wow to well-being scale here, really concerned about what's the wow factor. What about that fundamental thing, that well-being factor? Um, you know, it's, it's why, why would you do that? I mean, we come home from a busy day at the office and say, oh, I'm going to go and sit on my big shiny red puff. 
and look out the window. I mean, why would you do it? This is how do you this this scent this sensual thing is really important. So too many architects up here, but I judged the I was one of the three judges on the best Scottish building about a month ago, and the one that won was amazing architect. Every time you turned a corner, there was another top note. You know, it might have been a view, it might have been a small uh, niche, it might have been everything. So this is really important. The, the, these top notes that make you feel so wonderful, they can be forms or lots of things. But this is what I really want you to take away, is the importance of thermal landscaping of buildings now. Because this is what's going to save us. Because like I showed you before, it's getting hotter and things are getting less safe. Thermal dis distress is really increasing and um, in some of the buildings that we've lived in and studied, um, each room will have a different base note, you know. So you've got, this is a Haveli and Jaisalmir, you've got, this is time lags. You can get nearly a month difference between outside and inside in the, as you couple it to the earth, because any building is more or less coupled to the sky or the earth. This has got a big stable base night and this is just like all over the place. So begin to understand the thermal landscapes of your buildings. I mean, in the European heat waves, we lost 72,000 people. Where did they die? They died at the tops of buildings that got so hot. A lot of them were the poorer elderly people in the hot sides of buildings. Um, and now we're creating cities in which there are no cool sides, um, where the shiny cities and shiny environments are really destroying. Do you remember the cool corners you'd sit in a cafe and so on? And in Hurricane Sandy in Manhattan, these buildings, some of these buildings went really toxic because you couldn't open the window and you lived on the 16th floor and the lights went out for two days and you are not going to carry your bucket of water up to the flats so they became putrid and had to be abandoned. Adelaide, I was doing this for Terry Williamson, but he didn't come. Five days after, five days of, of 42 plus, and people died. I mean, about 2,000 people, it's the elderly. And of course, at the peak of that heat wave, what happens? They exceeded the capacity to generate enough energy so you get blackouts. So just at the time when you're most fragile, and the cost of energy goes up, so those fuel poor who can't afford to pay the, the bill at the end of the month um, are really, really stressed. And look at this, there's a fundamental flaw in many modern buildings, and that's the big room. There's no safe hiding place in that. She'll have a little bedroom, you know, and if she's unlucky, that's where it's facing to. She can't get away. You see, thermal mass can be really difficult, it can be really brilliant. So with thermal mass, you've got lots of different charging strategies. So if you've got a wonderful mud brick house facing west, you've got problems because it's a, a slow burning oven. Here we have adaptive thermal comfort opportunities from the Netherlands. This is Naughty Elders. And she's got a two-sided house. She's, she's got selective. This is a small social housing house. You've got the cool side and you've got the warm side. And so you're actually taking a very simple box and you're giving them an escape place in different seasons. Um, so storage strategies, um, the use of warm cores, air locks, uh, whether it's traditional architecture used it a lot, you can have the lightweight perimeter. Here's my own house with a, a big warm core coupled to the stove with air locks and so on. <coughs> You've got discharging strategies. Manuel's house in the high Alps of Argentina, he uses a fan and a rock store under, underneath his terrace. Mine, I just use buoyancy in the centre. An effective shading, you know, you cannot heat um, thermal mass. And an effective dumping systems. this is Naughty's house again. But we need new tools. How do we... The, the, the design programmes we have put everything in a big box, all the machines and the structures and everything, shake it up and spit out... A number which is the wrong answer. How do we know? I mean, if we had this is Jane in her Haveli, she invented the comforter, which over every hour, over every day, over every year, shows you the different temperatures so you can see where people where parts of a building are getting really hot. Now here's a homage to this wonderful underground building. 
And just to flag up the admittance method, which is a simple calculation method that looks at the admittance of buildings, the ability to, of a material to heat, retain and emit heat, um, to gain, retain and emit heat. Um, the decrement factor, it's a very good, robust, simple tool and the relative amplitude of different temperatures in the house. So that's what Ecotech, Andrew Marsh used for Ecotech, for instance. But Naughty, she just does this, when are we getting solar gain in different rooms over the year? So you can begin to see that in July and August, which is our summer, you've got real problems because you've got solar access in this room, that room. You know, so you can begin to get a feel with different methods. How do you actually work out where you're going to get the extreme temperatures in your own house? And here is one of my students, Abdul Rahman, in Dammam, in the Gulf, and here we've got a simple nickel graph, which is very useful if you're going to a new climate. Mean maximum, mean minimum. Giovanni says in a good passive building, you can get an internal climate that's about halfway between. And you've got the adaptive algorithm that shows you what adapted local populations will find comfortable. So you can work out what your cooling load is and your heating load is in winter. And... Um, but his studies, if you go down to a building by building place, in, this is a you know, very hot climate in the Gulf. Look at this living room. Buffered, this is north, and this is the west. You get a west facing bedroom, and you're getting these badly behaved base notes in there. Whereas the buffered living room, you're getting that nice steady temperature here. Thermal buffering and ransom zones. So buildings and sides of the house or a building you can shut off. Here's the, if we look at north there, so we got west there. That living room's really quite well behaved. This is a bit, this one's thermally toxic, so you'd abandon that at various times of day and year. And, um, oh, sorry, he's too clever for me. Uh, again, you know, open plan house. This is open plan living. Now here we've got north facing, so we've got all that west access here. And look at the temperature difference. You've got an east facing, north east facing room, and you're like five or six degrees centigrade cooler, but that open plan living, which we all love so much, means that you cannot get away, yeah? So when you're designing your houses and your homes, be very careful about the charging strategy you have for your mass, but also, get yourself a nice little cool refuge for those that week that's really, really hot. And that's the thermal landscaping there. So these are the temperatures in Damami homes, and he studied all these homes. And it's basically your 35 to 20. This is occupied temperatures. And do you know what? He's the mean one, the one who's got a house up here. He's really mean. He never turns on his air conditioning. His wife complains, but, you know. And this study of why those different houses have such therm different thermal personalities or characters, do you know what matters? It's the base note decisions that are critical that will put a building at the top. Look at this, percentage of openings. The ones at the top, these are the best houses, 18, 7 percent, 10 percent. Look at the ones down at the bottom, 48 percent openings in the Gulf. Um, so these base note decisions are really important. And also this idea of designing for climate refuges. Yeah, the cool side, the bottom. Create those wonderful spaces that you're going to, to really love. And how do you get it done? This is a thing I did with Adelaide in the Renew magazine. I think I've referenced it here. And also um, I did this with New Zealand. If you've got an elderly relative, but let's face it, all of us pretend to care about everybody, but the people who we really care about is our kids, our parents, and close relatives. So this is, I've got the warm grand plan and the cool grand plan. So every person who's vulnerable should have a safe room. You know, the one with the triple glazing or the double glazing, the nice carpet, the comfortable chair, the... The, the little heater next to them, that'll keep them warm enough. Or the cool grand plan, that place where you know that even when it's 42 outside, you can have a little solar fountain or you can do something. Anyway, in the Renew magazine, I, I've done the how do you design a cool plan. 
And how do you assess a comfortable building or a good building? How about using frozen music as a, th as a, as a, a, ba uh, as a key or a guide? Does that building have a good ba is it, has it got a good, is it well behaved? Has it got a good stable bass note? Yeah, because if it's too psychotic, then it's a bad built, toxic building. <laughs> don't buy it, don't touch it. How many adaptive opportunities has it got? What are they and will they be sufficient to keep temperatures within that, do you remember my safe zone? 10 to 35? If you can keep it within that, you can adjust, adjust and adapt, adapt with that. And then, of course, great buildings. How many top notes does it have? What are they? Where are they? How do they fit on the wow to well-being <laughs> scale? You can walk it. We're very keen in Europe at the moment on Higgy, little cosy build, gorgeous coziness in winter. You know, it can be in many, it can be a feeling. You walk into a room, you think, wow, or see a view through a window, wow. Uh, and a lot of modern homes, are in the judging this panel, you get a big oblong room, and you get one wall facing the view, and so you walk in, and that's it. That's your wow. That's your one top note. So where are the others? They've forgotten them. You know, they think one top note's enough. The really brilliant buildings is every time you turn a corner, there's a a top note, and that elevates the spirits and make you, makes you feel so much be better. And then, does the building have a hot or a cold weather climate refuge? Yeah, I think that now in our warming world, that's going to be essential. So where do mud brick buildings fit? Okay, yeah. Mud brick buildings fit right in the middle. Now, who is it saying about the Melbourne houses? This is, oh, I've, don't tell me I forgot. No, okay. Yeah, here we go. This is 20 mud brick homes measured by Lyrian Daniels, who's doing wonderful work on mud brick. These are winter recordings. These are summer recordings, and Fergus has done that. That's the UK winter outline, and this is the Damami summer outline. And here we've got 30 degrees. So it's just like that chap on the first day said, you know, Melbourne mud brick houses keep you really cool in summer. You need to wear a jumper in winter, yeah? Or what they do is they have little heaters, yeah? Um, and in a world, a warming world, where buildings will become more and more thermally toxic, especially badly behaved base note buildings, you can sell mud brick by saying, I'm giving you a climate safe building you know, where you can, you and your family can stay climate safe. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive, I think. Um, and this is, na this is um, where you just simply open the windows. And here, without any en energy expenditure, you know, it's that, that first step, a really good building. You don't need cooling in summer in a really good one. And just a final one from my wonderful university, Harriet Watt, is um, Sam and Gabriella are developing the new Kinotech brick. Um, unfired brick with 90% recycled content from demolition and construction waste. They, we're using quite a bit of fly ash too. Um, and we're really into the sort of th circular economy thinking, how can we clean up as we go sort of thing. Um, so that's there. it's not really developed that website yet, yet but um, how are we going to get this? They, they're moving into production because the Scottish government, the brilliant Scottish government who believes in the well-being of all their citizens and wants to create, they've realised that light, we have terrible overheating problems in Scotland because of this lightweight passive house move. You know, over, overglazed buildings, some of them you can't even open windows, lightweight timber, matchsticks, chipboard, cheap developer stuff. And they're looking for new products for the future. So they've given them half a million to, to roll it up to production. So you need, above all, to visions from government level. And you need new ways of thinking about building in a very different world. Thank you very much.